talk about a new book that just came out uh, that I wrote uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, I gave it a sprint, three months intensive writing, and uh, it just it just appeared uh, at the beginning wow. of September. Um, so uh, yes, I'm uh, Andre Gagne. I'm full professor in the Department of Theological Studies, and I'm. Uh, of course, uh, I, I do specialize in biblical studies, uh, interpretation of the Bible and its reception, but also uh, everything related to uh, what is called the Christian right or the religious right in America, uh, specifically traditions uh, that emerge from what we call uh, neo-charismatic and Pentecostal traditions, um, issues around evangelicals, and fundamentalism. And I do some work also on uh, religion and violence. So this is a bit of, about me, but uh, we're gonna talk about, um, and I'm gonna uh, share my screen uh, with you. Uh, we're, we will talk about specifically uh, evangelicals uh, and their political impact uh, on uh, the election. So I, I, I hope you, you can see uh, my screen here, uh, if it's clear for you. Um, so we're going to focus for a few minutes, and we can take some questions and comments uh, after this, on uh, evangelicals for Trump. Who are they, and how will they vote? Especially we're <laughs> in a few weeks uh, uh, to the coming elections, and this is an important voting block. Uh, so. What I'm going to be sharing with you a bit is um, comes out from some of the uh, information that you can find. If some of you read French, uh, I just published this book called Ces Évangéliques derrière Trump, Hégémonie, Démonologie et Fin du Monde. So uh, the book is focuses on evangelicals, but more specifically on a, a uh, a, a strand of evangelicals uh, in America that we call neo-charismatic Pentecostals and specific uh, important actors, political actors that were influential uh, during the 2016 election and have been also very much influential throughout uh, Trump's uh, uh, presidency and are still very much involved in trying to figure out ways to get uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, reelected. So you can, the book appeared at the beginning of September, uh, was mainly in Europe, but now it's over here. So it's available on Amazon, Indigo, and other libraries if you're interested. Um, in the book, what I do is I focus on ideas because, of course, when we talk about politics, there's a lot of things that we can uh, focus on. And my interest is in the relationship between politics and religion. And this book focuses on a specific social group called the evangelicals, but also on their political ideas, huh? um, their political theology, uh, as, we can, uh, as we can call it. Um, so we know uh, that in 2016, they had a very, very profound impact on uh, President Trump's victory. Uh, and we're still talking about it today, uh, 80, 80 to 81% of white evangelicals uh, that uh, label themselves as born again Christians. Uh, this is an expression that is used often uh, in uh, these circles to talk about the conversion experience. Right? So to be a born again Christian is to be someone that went through a conversion experience uh, his life or her life was transformed uh, through uh, the message of the gospel. So 81%. Um, at the time, uh, this corresponded to approximately 10% of uh, the population in the U.S. Now, we can ask ourselves this question, uh, what are they planning for this coming election? And uh, just out today, a uh, very interesting um, statistics that came out from, from uh, the Pew Research Center, which is a very, very important uh, statistic uh, center in the US uh, that, that 
takes all sorts of surveys on all sorts of uh, social and political issues for Americans, and they're very much interested in, in religion. And there was another uh, very interesting uh, survey from Lifeway. Who, uh, Lifeway is a, a kind of a conservative uh, evangelical uh, survey house also that does very well in, in trying to figure out who uh, will be voting uh, in uh, the elections. And it's interesting to note that uh, if the election was today, uh, we would still have 78% of white evangelicals that would support Donald Trump uh, compared to 17% that would uh, vote for, for Biden, for the Democrat. Uh, when we think in terms of Protestants also, white Protestants that are not evangelical, uh, they would vote at 53% for, for Trump and white Catholics would vote at 52%. So there's not a lot of, and you see on the right column, you have, of course, uh, those that uh, don't believe in anything particular or don't identify themselves. You have Jewish, Hispanic, uh, Catholics, and atheists, and Black Protestants. Eh? So you see that in the minorities, a lot of people will vote uh, favorably for the Democratic uh, Party. Uh, so there's not been much change in the support from this very important uh, group of uh, voters. And when we think about um, the other uh, survey that you have on the, on the right, half of US Protestant pastors uh, will vote for Trump, will back up uh, for Trump again. They will back him up. Uh, and when we think about US Protestant pastors, these are all U.S. Protestant pastor. That includes, of course, evangelicals, and it includes also mainline Protestant pastors. So at 53%, again, uh, will uh, uh, support Trump in the coming election. That is up from 40% in 2016, which is, which is interesting in and of itself. So if you would divide, uh, you know, between evangelical pastors and Protestant mainline pastors, that would be six, approximately 68% of evangelical pastors would, would support a Trump and uh, about 20% of mainline pastors. Now, the question is why Trump? You, you see, because this is one of the things that people constantly ask me, uh, why would evangelicals that hold to social ultra conservative uh, ideas, uh, Christian ideas, Judeo-Christian ideas, vote for someone that doesn't seem to reflect in his personal life those types of ideas? What, what, is, what are the issues? So why Trump? Uh, there is a reason for that. Uh, very early on, there has been some kind of myth that was created around the figure of Donald Trump very, very early on. Uh, of course, Trump is not the only political figure that uh, was compared to what we can call biblical characters or biblical figures. Uh, but Trump, uh, very early on, and there was even a book in 2016 written by a um, Christian entrepreneur uh, who's also uh, understood in uh, neo-charismatic circles as, as some kind of prophet. Um, I wrote a book called God's Chaos Candidate. And uh, in this book, he argues that Trump should be and is understood as, should be understood as a modern day King Cyrus. So who is King Cyrus? He was a Persian king who lived in the sixth century before Common Era. A very important influential individual, in fact, that uh, was uh, instrumental in liberating the Jews that had been under captivity for many, many years. And he permitted the Jews to go back to their country and rebuild their temple. And uh, what's interesting, he's mentioned uh, in the Bible, in the Hebrew portion of the, the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, or what some call the Old Testament, he's mentioned in Isaiah chapter 45, which is a prophetic book in the Bible. And it's interesting how uh, the prophet Isaiah speaks of this figure 
um, the prophet Isaiah, in speaking about Cyrus, says that God calls him his shepherd and his Messiah, his anointed one. Now, what's interesting about uh, Cyrus is that Cyrus was actually a pagan, a pagan king. He did not share the values of <laughs> the Jews at the time. He was completely pagan. Uh, so he, he, uh, he was, in fact, for Jews, he would have been considered as being an idolater. But it's interesting that the Bible still calls Cyrus uh, a, a chosen one, a kind of Messiah, someone that's chosen by God for a specific task. And this is where this, this individual, uh, Lance Walnow, makes the connection between uh, Trump and King Cyrus. And of course, uh, in his book, if you have the patience to read this kind of book, uh, he explains that God revealed to him at one point in time that he should read and go see Isaiah chapter 44, uh, uh, chapter 45, uh, sorry. And uh, as he was you know, he felt in his heart that he should read this. He, he fell upon Cyrus and he made this kind of, he had a kind of a eureka moment where he made the connection between Isaiah 45 and Trump as being the 45th president of the United States. So connecting Isaiah 45, Trump uh, 45th president. So this is a bit his, his theory. And um, like I said, Trump, this, this kind of myth around the figure of Trump that God could use anybody, that God could even use a pagan for, to accomplish his will, uh, this has been uh, the case for, for Donald Trump. And if you look throughout his presidency, a lot of these evangelicals that support him compared him to King David, who was a, a, you know, a very, very uh, prestigious and important king in the Bible. Trump is compared to King David. Uh, he's compared to Queen, the Queen Esther, and even to Jesus. So there's uh, all sorts of ways to, to kind of legitimize why these evangelicals in such an important proportion would uh, support someone like Donald Trump that doesn't really reflect in his personal life uh, the types of Judeo-Christian values that they, uh, that they themselves adhere to. For them, they were saying, we're not electing a bishop in chief, we are electing a commander in chief. And uh, Trump was, was very, very much cognizant of their own preoccupations and their own grievances. He listened to them. And that is why they put their support behind him. Now, among the ideas that I, that I talk about in this book, I, I specifically focus and I dedicate two chapters of my book to what is called their political theology of power. So they have, uh, through time, developed uh, this kind of political theology. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with this. Maybe, maybe you're not as familiar with this, but that's fine. Uh, it's called, this idea has been called dominionism. And um, one of uh, the researchers that has worked on the idea of dominionism for the past, I would say, 20 to 30 years is Fred Clarkson, who is a researcher associated with the Political Research Associate uh, in the US. And he defines dominionism in this, in, in this way. Dominionism is the theocratic idea that regardless of the theological view means or timetable, Christians are called by God to exercise dominion over every aspect of society by taking control of political and cultural institutions. Now, this, this political theology, I don't have time in this presentation to explain to you where this comes from. Originally, it comes from uh, um, a Presbyterian by the name of Ruzash Rushduni, who was the founder of a movement in the 60s and, and, and the 70s called Christian Reconstructionism, where the main idea was to reconstruct American society on Christian values. And he developed a very complex uh, theology uh, of power 
uh, this dominionist aspect. And essentially it bases itself on a reading from the book of Genesis in chapter uh, one verses 26 to 28. We'll not read this passage, you can read it on your own, but it's a particular interpretation of this, of this verse. This is a passage that is found uh, at, at the end of the first creation story where God invi invites humankind to rule over the earth and to administer uh, the creation and to subdue it and to rule over the creation. But the way they interpret this is uh, this rule uh, needs to be exercised by Christians, okay? So this is what dominionism is about. Now, you have theologians that have developed this idea in, in a more systematic way. One of those theologians that passed away in 2016, but a very, very influential theologian amongst evangelicals. Uh, he was a professor at the famous Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California for 30 years. His name is C. Peter Wagner. And uh, one of the things that Wagner does is the, he explains uh, what his dominionism is all about. And I have a quote here from a book that he wrote on that specific topic. And uh, this is how he explains his political strategy. Our theological foundation is what has been called dominionist theology, dominionist theology. This means that our divine mandate is to do whatever is necessary by, by the power of the Holy Spirit to take back what Adam handed over to Satan in the Garden of Eden, dominion over God's creation. It is nothing less than to see the kingdom of God come and his will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We want to see cities, regions, states, and whole nations transformed and living according to the values of the kingdom of God. This will only happen when the saints focus on the kingdom and become the head and not the tail. Now, when he talks about the saints here, he's not talking about saints in the Catholic tradition, but he's talking about Christians in general, okay? So the Christians need to take charge. They can't be this expression, the head and not being the tail, means that they need to be uh, in leadership position. So you see, they can't, they just can't be at the, at, the, at the end of all things. They have to be at the top of all things. And this is how dominion uh, theology or dominionist theology is understood in some of these uh, charismatic circles. Now, I talk about charismatic dominionism, of course, in my book, because I focus more on neo-charismatic Pentecostal groups uh, within evangelicalism that have this political idea. Now, this is a political theology of power, but they need a strategy to bring about this social transformation, to bring about this change, to bring about uh, this, this idea of dominionism. And they have developed through time a strategy that is called the Seven Mountains Mandate, okay? And this, this is not like something that I'm inventing or whatever. You can read their books, eh? Their books speak about this, you know, in, in profusionally. Uh, Wagner, in his book on, on dominion, he talks about the mandate. And the Seven Man Mountains Mandate is essentially uh, reclaiming what they call uh, seven spheres of culture. And they understand culture uh, uh, as, as being, or the world or society in and of itself, as being divided into spheres of cultural influence. Now, these spheres of cultural influence, they, they are mentioned here, they are arts and entertainment, business, education, family, government, media, and religion. Now, the goal of these uh, cultural mountains, or at least to possess or reclaim these cultural mountains, is to have Christians 
that uh, believe in this mandate to gravitate and, and, and to uh, kind of climb these mountains of influence to become the top leaders in each of these mountains of influence in order to change the spheres of culture. So in the political sphere is to have Christians involved in politics and change the political climate of a society. In media, it's to have people involved that are Christians that will change what the message that we find in media. In arts and, and, and entertainment, how do you change the world of arts and entertainment? You have Christians becoming believers and being influencers in the world of art, uh, arts and entertainment. Recently, you've heard about Kanye West. This is an example. Kanye West converted to evangelical Christianity. Kanye West has an incredible following and Kanye West uses now his music to influence his followers uh, and uh, influence uh, the arts and entertainment world. We can say the same thing with, with Justin Bieber, who, who a couple of years back converted to evangelicalism and, and now um, uh, attends a Hill Song church. So this is how you change culture. This is how you uh, penetrate society and change society. This is their political theology. This is their political theology of power. And in my book, I spend uh, two chapters explaining why Trump becomes an important figure in facilitating by influencing politics and policies, facilitating Christians to penetrate these spheres of culture. So this is why, you know, when Trump, for example, um, lauds his uh, political achievements, saying that he's the one that, uh, you know, put in place two uh, uh, conservative uh, uh, Supreme Court judges, and he's nominated a third one, uh, he's influencing uh, government there. He's influencing the world of uh, the uh, judicial and uh, uh, political spheres. Huh? Uh, when he's uh, saying that he's appointed over 300, uh, somehow 300 federal judges across the US. Huh? When he's talking about uh, being the defender of what these evangelicals, cr evangelical Christians understand to be religious uh, freedom. Huh? Uh, but the religious freedom that they understand uh, or that they adhere to is not a religious freedom that takes into consideration pluralism. Huh? It is not a religious freedom that can function in the context of a pluralistic and liberal democracy. Huh? Um, so when Trump talks about his uh, dealings with Israel, for example, these are all things that for them uh, is worthwhile and for them uh, confirms that they should be once again supporting uh, Donald Trump for a second mandate. Now, this is their political theology. Now, the political theology and their ideas of social transformation uh, faces opposition. You know, there's a lot of people that are really reacting very, very negatively uh, with this last nomination. And you've, you're hearing about the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett now, and the confirmation uh, hearings are, are on, and there are a lot of people reacting on the Democratic side of things, and a lot of people from the left uh, are saying this makes no sense, and what Trump is trying to do uh, makes no sense, and uh, you know, these ultra conservative religious groups are really happy with what's going on, but they're facing opposition. And the opposition is framed in a particular way. Uh, it's always un been understood as what these Christians are experiencing is a cultural war. Right? Uh, it, since, the, since Roe v. Wade, and even a bit prior to that, we've seen in America these religious groups are trying to co opt. Uh, politics and trying to bring about change in the political sphere. We've seen this with the rise of the moral majority in the 1980s, huh? uh, where they had Ronald Reagan elected twice as president. 
Uh, we've seen this during the Bush, the, the Bush administration, and Bush, uh, Bush C, uh, Jr. But now what we're seeing with uh, the Trump administration is a shift from the cultural war to what uh, is called spiritual warfare. Now you see on the screen a very, very influential evangelical uh, prosperity gospel preacher by the name of Paula White Kane. Paula White Kane is Trump's spiritual advisor. She has known Trump for some 20 years or so. And she is actually the, the person responsible for rallying evangelicals in 2015 behind Trump. When Trump met uh, a group of evangelical uh, pastors and leaders at the Trump Tower in September 2015, it is Paula White Kane that uh, launched this initiative. It is Paula White Kane that managed to bring together evangelicals from different uh, backgrounds and different types of beliefs to support Donald Trump. So she is a very, very influential player. She's actually the first woman to pray at a presidential inauguration. And she currently leads the effort behind a group called Evangelicals for Trump. And they're going around the country and doing rallies to incite evangelicals to continue supporting Donald Trump. And she prayed at Trump's re-election campaign kickoff in 2019. But when she shows up in the media and prays, she engages in what is called spiritual warfare. And even in her rhetoric, and those that are close to her, those evangelicals, especially those charismatic Pentecostal leaning evangelicals that support Trump, they engage in what is called a spiritual warfare rhetoric, where their goal is essentially to demonize political adversaries. And they constantly quote passages from the Bible saying, for example, here we have a text uh, that is a very, very famous passage used by a lot of these people that engage in uh, demonizing political adversaries. It's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for we struggle not against flesh and, and blood, but against uh, uh, the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of, uh, of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Now, if you listen carefully to how they characterize, for example, the Democrats. Um, they essentially demonize Democrats by saying that the Democrats are an anti-God party. They are a party of socialists and they tie socialism, of course, to their obsession against communism. And for them, communism equals, of course, atheism. So, if you vote for Democrats, you're voting against Judeo-Christian values and against uh, Judeo uh, uh, and against uh, and against God. Eh? So you become their political adversaries. So they demonize the Democrats, and you can hear some of them. Uh, you know, for example, our our our, uh, our friend Lance Wallnau, the one that wrote the book on Trump, Cyrus as Cyrus. Uh, clearly states that the Democrats are influenced by uh, a de demonic powers, essentially. That's how they, they characterize uh, these political adversaries. So it's a way to disqualify political adversaries from uh, the political sphere. Huh? So again, it's pushing uh, their, uh, their supporters, um, again, in the direction to vote for Republicans. You see, in the minds of a lot of these ultra-conservative uh, Christians, you cannot be a Christian if you vote for a Democrat. You can't be Christian if you're a Democrat. But we know that this is not the case. We know that Joe Biden is a Catholic, and he's actually a practicing Catholic. And that we know that there are you know, progressive Christians in America that will vote for uh, for Biden. And we even know there's a group now that came out uh, that are even evangelicals that are pro-life that will be voting for B Biden, despite the fact that they're, they are pro-life. Huh? They, don't, they don't recognize themselves uh, anymore in the Republican Party, and even less so in uh, Donald Trump. So you see, 
you have this political theology of power that uh, they're trying to implement. Huh? And at the same time, it encounters resistance. And this resistance is, of course, uh, framed in terms of spiritual warfare. But all of this urgency to vote for Trump, and uh, you know, it's so important that Trump be elected, all of this is also framed in what I, I call their eschatological discourse. Their eschatological discourse, their eschatological fictions. Now, what do I mean by eschatology? Eschatology is the teaching of the last times or the end times. So these, these evangelicals that support Trump, a lot of them interpret what is happening in the world, for example, ge various geopolitical events in light of some end of the world biblical prophecies. So what they do is they read the Bible in a particular way, and they have a particular interpretive frame by which when they look at what's happening in the world, they use the Bible to interpret geopolitical events. There have been several events uh, that happened during the Trump presidency. For example, one notable, very, very notable event for these people was the uh, US embassy move from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem on uh, May 14, 2018. And this is where, you know, even people like Benjamin Netanyahu, who is the president of the modern state of Israel, the prime minister of the modern state of Israel, even compared Trump to King Cyrus. Even Netanyahu did that. So uh, what does that mean? You know, what, what is the political significance of moving this uh, embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? What you're saying is that you're uh, agreeing with the fact that Jerusalem is the unique, uh, the unique capital the only capital of the modern state of Israel. And this aligns itself with the idea in the Bible, of course, uh, when they read the Bible, they understand that the Bible talks about in Jerusalem as the unique indivisible capital of uh, the Jewish uh, people. So for them, it fits very well because Jerusalem, in their understanding of the last days or in the end times, Jerusalem has a central role before the second coming of Christ, before Jesus Christ comes back to earth and establishes his kingdom on earth, Jerusalem will have a pivotal role. Uh, there was also the murder of uh, General, uh, Iranian General Soleimani at the beginning of this year, also seen in a, an eschatological end times, uh, as an eschatological end times scenario. Uh, Iran is seen as an enemy of God. It's called Persia in the Bible. And they read one of the texts from uh, a, a, a Hebrew Bible prophet by the name of Ezekiel that talks about a final end times battle against Israel where Persia will be, uh, will be one of the nations coming against Israel. And they see this event as kind of setting the stage for this end time battle. Um, so again, this event of you know, the opposition of Iran to, uh, it, uh, towards Israel is seen and interpreted in light of the end times. And of course, there's the recent peace talks uh, called the Abraham Accords uh, that are also led, uh, read, sorry, uh, in light of biblical prophecies. So with all of this in mind, their eschatology or their theology of the end times serves their political theology. Because in the end, for these people, the goal is to establish God's kingdom in the world and bring about the kingdom of God in America. And it makes me think about this last painting uh, that was, uh, in fact, uh, done by Joel Peltier in 2004, that was during the Bush years. And here he has all the major players you can't see, or maybe you, there's names that you, you will recognize, but others not, but all the major, major players 
of the Christian right and the ideologues of the religious right uh, that are in the crowd. And you have Jesus's triumphant entry into Washington where he's going to establish his kingdom. So essentially, this is what I wanted to share with you. Um, this was very, very brief. Uh, there are a lot more information in the book. So if you do read French, uh, grab the book. I really explain a lot of uh, uh, concepts and terms that are sometimes uh, uh, difficult to understand, but it, it is a very simple book to, to read. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me this time. And we can take a few comments or questions if you have.